Hi, some of you know that uh, I am a volunteer at our local libraries teaching tech programs to teens and adults. And uh, over the years, I've been doing it for about 10 years, and over the years I've done Arduino, I've done uh, 3D design using Fusion 360, and uh, also uh, teaching people to 3D print things and everything. And I've had almost uh, 200 people learn to solder in my uh, solder projects class. I learned the solder projects class. And, uh, and you know, uh, all that came to a screeching halt during COVID, and we're past that now. But uh, during COVID, I started following Paul McCorder in, on the screen here. And uh, uh, first was learning Python and then... Uh, uh, Last year and a half or so, he's been doing uh, micro Python on the Pico W, and uh, uh, decide probably about time to uh, try uh, my own hand at teaching, uh, getting local students interested in micro Python on the Pico. So I got together a couple kits and uh, approached the local library and. Uh, uh, just basic kits, and uh, we're going to try an introduction to MicroPython using the Pico W. Um, of course, you know, people want to know what projects can you have. So I've got, you know, some uh, NeoPixel projects, of course, and just a basic blinking LEDs and everything like that, and OLED display and things like that that I'm going to show off. But uh, I always ask, you know, well, well I'm going to do a robot. <laughs> so um, robots, I have a love-hate re uh, relationship with building robots with these microcontrollers. Um, the first thing is, is that you uh, can't really uh, compete with what's on Amazon. So there's, this is what you can get for $20 on Amazon. It's a... You know, you get the controller, you get the car with all the flashing lights and uh, uh, running upside down and right side up and everything. And you just, you know, somebody, if that's all they want to do is to make a robot to just play with, you're better off going out and spending $20 at Amazon than you are doing uh, uh, robots. Of course, you know, learning how a robot works, that's a different story, but that is not a beginner project by any stretch of the imagination. Like I said, I was probably 60 weeks into Paul's videos before I even thought about uh, doing a, a robot with uh, uh, MicroPython and everything. And uh, I, with the Pico W, of course, you got the. Uh, uh, Wi-Fi on it. So I thought, you know, when I did decide to do a robot, I decided, well, let's try a robot, you know, just to see if I can get it with the motor controllers and the, um, with the Wi-Fi, you have to kind of roll your own and design your own user interface. Of course, you have to get into um, um, HTML and a little bit of JavaScript to, you know, and add that to your micro python code to send to the uh, web page or whatever your phone or your tablet or your computer that you're using to control it um, and i was somewhat successful with that and um, it worked okay but i did notice that you know it works over your local area network so your your pico logs into your local router as well as whatever device you're using to control it is on the local router. Now, I'm not sure whether it's the Pico or your device or whatever, but every once in a while you'll get where you'll get like a up to a 30 second pause where it won't work. It stops working for some reason. And it certainly can be my coding. I'm I'm using the basic libraries and whether they're glitchy or whatever, I don't know. But uh, it seems like for the real time thing that uh, control that you need with a robot that um, maybe that, you know, the Wi-Fi isn't 
set up to do that as well as, you know, to be bulletproof that you really need for a robot so you don't run into walls or something. Uh, but anyhow, uh, you know, Paul's using the Sun Founder kit and he hasn't gotten into it yet, but they also have what they call a controller app that you can download for Android and uh, Google Play, you know, for uh, and iOS for, um, you know, for your iPhone. And um, I tried that on both an Android tablet and my phone. Um, and it works. I didn't do a robot. I was just trying to use some of their basic programs in there. Um, you got a bunch of uh, different uh, widgets, I guess they call them, that you can put on your controller. And uh, it seemed to work, but again, it glitched out and sometimes it disconnected. And uh, again, it works over your local uh, local area network. So um, I, I spent the last week or so... Uh, messing with that or whatever but uh um it just uh i, I wasn't happy with it and so <laughs> i my uh intro to micro python in our library starts in about a month so i said it's time to just <laughs> go back to the basics so um so paul a while back let's see this was on lesson 78 so it wasn't too long ago paul was introducing us to the IR remote control. So um, a couple of days ago, I just uh, scrapped all the app, the uh, Sun Founder app, and I had used had decided not to use Wi-Fi on my own uh, a while back, and uh, I said, "Well, let's use uh, uh, the IR control." IR is terrible for a classroom setting because if you have more than one of them, the there's no uh, channels or anything, they're all going to get the IR signals. But for this demo that I'm doing, it work, it'll it be fine. And I've done that before with Arduino. So I knew that it was probably fairly rock solid to use it that way. So um, I uh, on the Wi-Fi robots that I did, and I uh, used the um, a motor control board. Uh, I think it was a Kitronics motor control board, and you kind of just uh, your Pico kind of just plugged right into it, so you could your Pico W, so you could use it that way and uh, control two or four motors. I think I think they have two different boards that can do that. And um, uh, I mean, you know, you're talking you know fifteen twenty dollars for the motor control board and everything and. Uh, uh, I just figured I'm trying to come up with a low cost solution in case somebody wants to, you know, do the work to come up and do, you know, hangs around with my micro Python thing at the library. I'm planning on having an introduction and then follow up with like mentorship with, you know, whether it's a group or a couple people or even a, I do even one person, I'd mentor one person if they want to do it. But I figure they, if I share this off, they might actually get to that point. And I didn't want it to be a real call, a high dollar robot. So um, I've always liked when I was doing Arduino, I always liked the continuous run servos. So um, let me stop the share here. And uh, so I got this um, designed, a 3D printed this uh just little robot frame and just got a half size breadboard sitting on top of it. Uh, it's just two pieces. This part's separate. Um, so it was a nice, easy 3D print. And, uh, but it's got two continuous run servos. And I like this idea of, uh, I think I got it from Kev's Robots where he just uh, like embeds the uh, servo right into the uh, thing. And you even got the... Uh, where you got the uh, uh, wires in bed, you know, because you got to have the wires where they come out and got to trace for the wires to go in. But anyhow, the good thing about continuous run servos is you don't need a motor control board. They will, you control them just like you would a regular servo, except uh, uh, 90 is 
uh, stop and zero is forward all full forward and um, 180 or whatever range you're using is um, uh, all the way you know is is backwards or or I might have that wrong but either way uh, they spin one way when it's zero and spin the other way when it's at the full range and the mid range is a stop so uh, they're fairly cheap I mean they're probably a dollar more than the regular blue servos and I I, I can't remember I've bought these uh wheels here a uh, set of wheels uh several years ago and um, I I don't think they were too expensive and they just kind of fit right onto the uh servo instead of using a servo horn they just go on like that and uh so anyhow it's a pretty uh economical way to go like I said uh with servos, I like to use five volts. I've tried 3.8, you know, like using LiPo batteries on them, but uh, you can see in here, I got um, four um, AA batteries, just regular AA batteries in a pack. Um, that was mainly, I just wanted something simple that you could do. Um, batteries, rechargeables are way to go and like i said if you buy something at uh, at amazon you're going to get uh rechargeable batteries and stuff like that so this, like i said this is a learning to this is a learning platform it isn't it isn't a toy to to put together to and then have fun with till you crash it because with even with everything i got here i think i got like 25 to 27 dollars in all the parts and um, that's about as cheap as I can get away with making a robot. I think the Wi-Fi one with the uh, board I had and the kit and everything with the little yellow TT motors, I think it ended up being $40, $45 by the time I got done. And uh, um, it just, like I said, it just isn't what you want to do with it anyhow. So let me get back to my screen here. Oh, all right. So, um, anyhow, I, like I said, printed up the parts and everything and, uh, um, got it started and, uh, used what we were learning with Paul's, uh, IR controller. So, uh, um, got just the IR controller here and, uh, let's see if I can get, it. so, I figured that um, I like to use like the forward, reverse, and then the uh, the top nine buttons on the IR remote that he's showing. And uh, the forward would be the middle one, and then two down would be the middle one you're not using at all. And the two down, which is the minus on mine, is reverse. And then you got the reverse left reverse right forward left forward right and then the uh, uh, buttons in the middle the uh, I like to use them as like spin with two wheel robots it's always fun just to use a spin mode on it and uh, so that's what I do with that so and uh, I thought about using the bottom number button but I said well the way you hold a, rem a remote you're using it you're better off holding it and then easier to get to the top buttons. Like I said, you don't worry about what they are. You just feel them and say, okay, that's the middle. I want to go forward or whatever with it. And uh, everything works out well with that. But uh, anyhow, let's get to the code. Um, let's see where we're at. So we're all plugged in here. Let me make myself smaller. Uh, so you got your machine and you got your two libraries you need for using the infrared remote, uh, of course, time. Uh, and then um, we're using the servos, like I said, the continuous run servos. So we're doing that. I uh, knew I need some global variables. So my favorite way to do global variables is just to make a 
variable co class. I don't even know what DD stands for. I just said, oh, DD sounds like what I want to use. I usually use a real short, just two letter name for a class. And then you just list your as class variables underneath, and then you can use them in your code wherever they don't, they don't, you know, you don't have to declare them as global or anyhow. Um, I did the thing again where I made my IR, I uh, just able to plug it right into the next to this um, breadboard right in with uh, in between pin 17 and 18 is a ground pin. So I'm able to use um, the IR pin is 17, ground pin is next to it, and then pin 18. I'm making that an output and turning it on. And that just supplies the 3.3 volts to the uh, IR sensor. So I don't have any wiring at all on that. I showed that in several other videos. It's a it's a neat trick that you just uh, put your IR thing, you know, your your IR sensor without having any wiring in it. Set up my two servos because I was close to the end of the board. I just said 15 and 16, which is one's on one side and one's on the other. Um, I wanted to have a life thing here, so I turned used the, the onboard LED create uh, as the LED. And then uh, I went through a lot of this. I'm probably not going to talk about it too much, but uh, we're creating a dictionary with the uh, IR number, I, the return numbers that you get. Uh, 6970 and 71 is the top row, 68 and then 67 are the middle row, and then uh, 721 and 9 are the third row down. Um, of course, like I say, we're not using but two on that row. We're not using the middle one on the second row. Uh, of course, we got our create our IR object, and then the callback for it is this here. And um, I thought about this. I actually worked hard work harder on the logic of this than I have on any project in a long while. <laughs> that took me, I spent an hour trying to come up with the logic on how to do this because I wanted to be able to hold the remote down. And of course you get the signal and then you get a bunch of negative ones coming out as a repeat. And I tried putting the repeat up here, the negative one in my IR dictionary, making it work that way. And uh, I tried doing it separately down here and everything. Uh, the problem is, is it, it, it's not that bad, but you get a negative. If you happen to press like a number button, which we're not using, and you hold it, you're going to get a negative one. So you don't want that negative one to be, uh, to be, you know, considered in anything unless you're pressing holding down one of the buttons that you're con that you really are you know that are controlling the thing so in the end i i, I just said oh. i said it would be so easy if i didn't have to worry about uh the getting the first number you know the 69 or the 70 or whatever uh, so in about 100 milliseconds you're not going to care what that uh 70 is because if you're holding it down you're just going to get that negative uh one so what i did is i actually said i don't decide i don't care about the 100 milliseconds that when i first hold it down all i need to do is store the number that comes in i don't have to don't have to do anything with it because 100 milliseconds later if you um hold it down just you it's hard to even hold it down and not get and press it and not get a repeat at least once on it so um i thought well let's let's do let's just ignore the that one and 100 milliseconds later if it's still held down we know we've stored what the key that you just pressed was so then um so i said if it's not a negative one then we're going to store it now it doesn't matter whether that's a key that we want or a key that we don't want. It doesn't that doesn't care about it because in the else, that means if you hold it down long enough that you're getting a negative one, you're going to come to this else. And then that's when you go in and say, 
if the number we stored in raw is in this dictionary up here, then it's a valid key. And then we're going to worry about it. If what was stored in here was not a valid key, then it's going to fall out of that and not do anything. So it made it so much simpler. I was, I think I had like 20 lines of code trying to get it all done and it still wasn't working and I couldn't figure out why it wasn't working. So I said, let's just ignore that first one. So now, because we, when you, you don't know when you let up on the key. So what we do is when we uh, have that repeat button, it's going to store the ticks milliseconds and update the ticks milliseconds in our time. I call it TS for timestamp. So it knows when the last uh, millisecond count, when the last uh, uh, IR data came through. It's going to put a timestamp on when the last IR data came through. And it's also going to take whatever the raw is, because now we know it was even though it's a raw number, if it's in this, that means it's it, it's a valid number. So we're going to use it as our current. And that's so in seven lines of code, we we got a function that's going to save what we need and only have it where we want it. So that's a good thing. Um, so then this is happening pretty much on its own. It's going to be, you know, interrupt driven or whatever by whatever the library does. So um, in our while true, all we have to do is check that the timestamp is occurred less than 200 milliseconds. I, it takes about 100 milliseconds to do 100 to 110 milliseconds to for each IR to come through. So I said, okay, so if, if we haven't had one for 200 milliseconds, then we're going to stop. We're going to set the position to uh, zero. Because um, uh, I forgot, I set up my um, servos, I got it so I can set up my positions at, from minus 10 to plus 10. So the mid range is going to be zero, minus 10 to plus 10. The mid range is going to be zero. And we'll talk about a little bit where the numbers came from a little bit later in here. But anyhow, so if it's less than 200, we're going to keep setting that servo to whatever the value is so this is a good time to go up so our ir dir dictionary is and then we're going to use whatever dd current is so dd current would be one of these numbers 69 70 71 68 7 all these so you're going to you that's what our current is and then for each of those you got uh, a, a list in there of two items and you got a I'm not actually using this I printed it and when I was working on it I printed these out so you might not you could probably take this out and simplify it a little bit but uh, I have a text item on the list and then I have a tuple in my list and the tuple are the two servo settings so for forward, because one servo is reversed from the other, they have to be mirror images. So if one's going full speed one way, the other one's got to be going full speed the other way to go forward. And you're just reversing that for back as well. When as far as the turns, I just took, well, you want to slow one of the servos down. So you want to slow down the right servo when you're forward right and you want to slow down the left servo when you're forward back so um it's um or forward left so anyhow this is what you got for the all the settings so they're between i just picked a point uh a, a three or th for the slow moving and uh, uh full speed is 10 it's only actually a two speed thing um and then of course stop is there but then when you want to spin it you take both of them the same direction remember up here to go forward you 
had one negative, one positive. So if you want to spin left, they're both negative. If you want to spin right, they're both positive. So uh, that's that's my control scheme that I have. And they went like that. So um, to set this, like I said, it's, you know, you're using the current, which is this number here. And then you're using the number one, remember your zero base, zero, one. So you're worried about the tuple. And then this gets the first number in the tuple. And this one gets the second number in the tuple. So that's a little bit. Dictionaries are fun, but they can get a little, uh, when you're using all these different data types in here, you know, you're tuples inside of a list inside of a dictionary so uh, it gets a little complicated but that's once you figure out what you need to do and what you're working through then that's how that works out okay and um, basically that's all there is to it and um, of course uh, like I said to run on the machine you got to put the program on the Raspberry Pi Pico, if you're not going to have a, you know, you can't run it from your hard drive up here. And then you got to deal with the main. So let's look at main, uh, because you actually don't, and this is the trick I came up with a while back that um, instead of calling the IR drive the main, renaming this to main. I like to do it this way. I just put a main and I import whatever program that I want to run in it. So um, since I don't have any other programs in here, it wouldn't have been a big deal to rename that because that's all I'm using it for. But if you have like multiple programs down here and you want to run it and you just rename one main, all of a sudden you say, what is main? So by doing it this way, you can tell Oh well, main. I want to. I'm all I'm doing is doing this. And if you, I've actually you've probably seen it in the past where I have several imports and I just uncomment the ones I don't use and uncomment the one that I don't. I want to use it. It works really well. So um, anyhow, that's how I the code the, the files on there. Of course, you need your libraries. You got your. IR library down here, and then you got your server library, which Paul taught us how to make. And uh, you know, like I said, everything I've learned, I've learned from Paul. So <laughs> I just try to take it. Once you learn the basics, you just try to figure it out and take it to the next level. So that's what uh, that's what we're doing. So um, I guess the only thing left to do is to show it running. And rather than doing it as that i've just got like a video of showing it running here on my iphone so let's just do that and hit play now it's a little jerky because it goes and stops but uh that's the spinning right and left trying to get it so it's pointing so forward is which way of the led is blinking because <laughs> it looks so symmetrical so you really don't know which way it's going and then i'm just doing a couple more spins and that's it anyhow that's that get back to the code so like i said um it's a simple robot, but it's still, this is something I would, I, I would want people to go through it almost as much as I have before I try introducing them how to use the, all this, where you learn how to make a servo go, you learn how to blink an LED, you learn how to um, use an IR sensor, then you can think about, you know, putting it all together. Cause like you say, well, you got to know about dictionaries, you got to, know about callback function. Um, robots are certainly farther down the stream, but this introduction class that I'm having, they're they're going to ask me, oh, well, can you make robots? And I better have at least one. Um, I might take the um, uh, Wi-Fi robot that I had, but uh, 
uh, <laughs> I might just say, oh, it won't work because you have to have a local area network. So it won't, you know, and you can't usually the public networks like the libraries, you can't do that. There's a workaround. You can create a hotspot with your laptop and then use it that way. But I might just take it in to show it off and say, yeah, this is what it would look like, but I can't run it because you can't do it on the on the library's uh, network. So anyhow, this video got super, super long and I doubt too many people watch it all the way through, but if you did, congratulations. <laughs> um, anyhow, uh, thank, I want to give a big thanks to Paul because like I say, I know nothing about Python or MicroPython without Paul. And he just keeps us so interested in learning week to week. And uh, uh, one, you know, he's a great teacher and uh, uh, glad that so many people follow him and people support him. Anyhow, have a great day, everybody. Thanks.